All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast. We are your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. My name is Robert Winfrey, and I am your host, per usual. On the agenda, we got a lot of stuff to talk about today, so we'll try to get through this in a timely fashion. Last night, the UFC's debut in the country of France. They were in Paris, UFC on ESPN Plus 67. We will talk about all the fallout from that. Um, main event, man. Good main event. Good main event. So we will go through all of that. And this coming Saturday, UFC's back on pay-per-view. UFC 279. Oh, I have so many conflicted emotions about that card. So many. But we will preview it in its entirety as it currently stands. So there's that. And then news of the week, such as it was. We got a few things. Nothing major, but a couple of things worth noting, I believe. So. We will get into that. All right. Uh, before we get going, as usual, please interact with the product a little bit. Like, comment, subscribe, star rating, written review. If you've done any and all of that, share. Tell people that you listen to the show. If you know anyone that is interested in combat sports, MMA, or the product in general, please point them in my direction and I will do my best to entertain them as I am entertaining slash informing you. All right, with that out of the way, UFC on ESPN Plus 67. Again, they debuted in France. They were prime time over there. So this was an earlier afternoon slash morning show here in the States. It was around 10 a.m. for me, noon East Coast. Main event, heavyweights. The native Frenchman, Cyril Gaon, getting his... I believe this was his first fight, his first MMA fight ever in his home country. Let me double check that, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he had Muay Thai fights in France, but as far as MMA goes, it was Montreal. It was various places in Quebec. Then his UFC debut in Uruguay. Then Singapore, South Korea, three in Vegas, Houston, and then Anaheim. Well, he's been a lot of places. Yeah, good for him. I'm not a fighter. But a few different people who are fighters and who succeeded at a very high level, um, some of them will talk about it on, like, their uh, social media channels or whatnot. There's somebody, I think it was um, was Gabriel Varga, who talked about it on his, uh, who's a very good kickboxer. Uh, He was a K1 champion, I seem to recall. I believe he fought for Bellator kickboxing. He was in karate combat not too long ago. But he mentioned one of the things on his on his YouTube channel, which is very informative, by the way, uh, was one of the perks of being a fighter. You actually do get to see the world. You know, I just mentioned Gon. You know, the guy was born in France, and he's fought in Canada, Uruguay, Singapore, South Korea, the in the United States, and France. He you know, has had now an MMA fight, and so he's been. That's every hemisphere. France is technically on the. Eastern side of the Prime Meridian, I believe. I'd have to double check that, but I'm fairly sure. Certainly Singapore is. He's been northern and southern hemispheres, um, and he's been, I believe, eastern and western. He'd be eastern and western as well if we derive, divide from the Prime Meridian. Has he been in every each quadrant? Singapore, Uruguay. Technically, yes. You could maybe argue for the. If you're on a flat map, that would be what the northeastern. Again, I'd have to double-check where France is relative to the Prime Meridian, but I believe he's been in every quadrant. So, again, that's, and he's, again, he's not the only one. I'm using him as an example here. But he defeats Tai Tuivasa via knockout. I have I have this listed as a front kick to the body and punches. It's officially just punches. Uh, 423 of the third. This fight was wild. The first round was pretty typical Cyril Gaon stuff. Some stabbing front kicks, a lot of movement, you know, a lot of stance switching, darting in and out, which he is very good at. Some pretty good pressure from Tuivasa, some better footwork out of Tuivasa than I expected. Uh, he never fully corralled Gone, but he was able to get a lot more pressure going than I expected him to. He clearly worked very hard on, the, on his ring generalship, so kudos to him for that. But first round... Pretty pretty solid round for Gon, but Tuivasa not out of it by any stretch of the imagination. Second round is where things get interesting. It's going Gon's way, the majority of it, pretty handily. 
He's upping the tempo as he normally does. He's kicking the body. He has this really nasty... It's not quite a front leg snap kick, which would be more of a teep. Um, he's got what my my martial arts system refers to as an inverted roundhouse. If you think of a traditional roundhouse, it comes kind of from open to close on the hip. So if you're kicking with your right leg, it would swing, you know, the same way your knee hinges, right? That's the way your hip kind of wants to go naturally. That's a roundhouse. An inverted roundhouse then goes the opposite direction. Now, you can't get your hip into the same position because your hips don't rotate that way, but it's the same general idea. You bring it up, and then instead of going straight like a front, like a snap kick would, you come at kind of an outside upward 45. If you're looking at a clock, it would be 1, you know, 1, 130. Like, that's the kind of angle you want to take with it, and that's what his front kick is. And it actually makes a lot of a difference, believe it or not, depending on your stance. One of the reasons you don't see that same kind of angle on the kick if you watch, like, Muay Thai, where they do a lot of lead leg, uh, front leg kicks, is because of the stance. It's actually just fine to throw it straight because of how square they are. Uh, if you And if you were to angle it like that, it would more glance. And you kind of shorten the range a little bit, depending... Uh, technically, it's a little bit shorter distance. But if you're dealing with someone that's in more of a closed stance or a bladed stance, I should say bladed, not closed, because closed is more how you are relative to your opponent. But throwing that little angle onto it actually makes it really effective. So instead of kind of coming towards more of the side where the ribs are, you're actually able to get it up into the belly and under the ribs. And it's a nasty kick if you're good at it. Uh, in fact, Gon is the one who made me change my opinion on that particular kick. We were taught it uh, in class for a while, and I... I didn't think much of the kick. Like, okay, if you're doing, you know, point fighting, and I mean that in the, and I don't mean that as a negative, but if you're doing the point break, point break, point break style of fighting, it's a nice little point getter. It'll score. But I questioned how useful it is, you know, in a continuous fight. And not too long after that, and I was, uh, it wasn't after I'd been taught it, but it was... I actually had a dis, I'd kind of had a discussion with some of my classmates and my instructor, and just like, you know, I don't like the kick. And I hate to be one of those... I, I'm not one of those guys who's, well, if I don't see it work in the octagon, it clearly doesn't work. That's a load of crap. But this one in particular, it's awkward to do. Now, I, I just didn't see a tremendous amount of utility depending on the situation. Not too much long after that, I wound up it was when Cyril Gon fought Derek Lewis, and he used that kick to great effect. Volkov too, actually, he kicked Volkov in the face with it, and I'm sitting there watching that fight and throws it up and holy crap! He, I mean, I mean, Cyril Gon's a large man. The fact that he kicked a guy who's six seven in the face with that kick anyway just speaks wonders to his flexibility. But I had the he had a, there was somebody else I was watching. Um, it wasn't, I forget who it was, who, who again, was using that same kick and made me kind of rethink its utility. So, he used that a lot here against Tuivasa, but he, he's doing that. And then Tuivasa, hard-charging, heavy-handed, finally is able to land a punch. I mean, he's landed a few here and there, but he's not really been landing flush. Finally gets gone in a slightly awkward position. Um, Gon, he moved a bit between orthodox and southpaw. Here he does a lot of switching, but he seemed to like southpaw relative to Tuivasa. I think that's because he, I, I don't know if he's right or left-handed. My hunch is he's right-handed. Uh, because his right hand, whenever he was in that stance, he was jabbing with it. And that's one of the benefits uh, of fighting with your dominant hand forward instead of in the back. Normally you put your power hand in the back. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I've talked about that in the past. But if you have your power hand forward, your jab becomes less of an annoyance and more of a you get more oomph behind it. Now, the downside, one of the reasons you want to train someone to fight with their power hand in the back is otherwise you, you just will never learn to do anything with your stupid hand. Uh, I, I, steal, I steal the description of your offhand as your stupid hand from Stephen King, actually. That's how... That's how Roland, in one of the Dark Tower books, refers to it. Like, because he loses a couple of fingers on his right hand. Like, no, I'm left-handed, so naturally, of course, I lose fingers on my right. 
I have to teach my stupid hand to do all the stuff that my smart hand used to do. So you, you put your stupid hand in front so that you learn to use it properly. But one of the benefits of doing it the other way is your power hand is forward. Dustin Poirier is right-handed, and he fights southpaw because it kind of lets him you know, get the get the power hand uh, closer and hit, hit with it more reliably. So I think Gon's right-handed. I don't know if he... This is another weird thing about this, about um, fighting in your human, the human body. You not only have a dominant hand, you do have a dominant leg. There is one leg you will be better kicking with than the other, and it's not always the same one. You can be right-handed and left-footed, for want of a better expression. And I'm somewhat envious of those people, because that means you can fight with your power hand in the rear and your good leg in the front. And that's kind of ideal. You know, if you're both, not I am, for example, I'm both right-handed and my right kick is much better. You know, it means I'm part of, any anytime I go southpaw, it's because I want my power leg closer. And I've had sparring partners occasionally punish me for that habit, so I need to work more on that. But I, so I don't know whether, whether Gon favors his right or his left leg, but I, I imagine he favors his right because he's more dexterous with it. He's more precise with it. So that puts you know, not only his power hand forward, but it lets him use that front leg as a constant threat of just making your life miserable in ways that maybe you're off and you get in your other leg wouldn't. And some of that's also the stance. Like he just yeah, he strikes me as a guy who just likes to be open relative rather than closed most of the time. A lot of guys with his kind of um, style do. Stephen Thompson famously likes to be open a lot. I mean, so does Pettis, but that's because Pettis likes open stance body kicks. But yeah, he so he's in southpaw and he's got decent enough guard position, but not quite good enough, and Tuivasa just gets a little bit closer than Gon expects, and even though the punch is partially blocked, it gets through enough, and it floors Gon. I thought he was done. I, I thought, you know, wholly upset, thought he was done. Nope. He gets dropped, and he gets dropped hard, but one of the things that Tuivasa's really good at, and I didn't talk about this last week, but he is really good at closing the show. Like, he can put you out with one punch, but what he's even better at is hurting you and then not giving you a chance to get back into things. Look at most of his finishes. Not all, but most. That's what happens. Like, he hurts you, and you're wobbled, and you know, blood in the water, man. Um, he he's, he's genuinely one of the better, like, finishers once you get hurt. And Gon seems to have been aware of that because he bounces up, he, get, he gets dropped right along the fence line. He bounces up. Tuivasa is still trying to punch him in the face. And he immediately gets off the cage, back to the center, and separates. Just does not give dangerous Tai Tuivasa a chance to really unload on him. Gets back to work. Tuivasa, again, pressures him. And one of the craziest reversals of fortune. Like, not the craziest, but one of them. Gon goes from being dropped to landing this crushing left body kick that doubles over Tai Tuivasa and backs him up. I mean, we're talking within, I, I mean, between the time he was, like, less than 20 seconds between those two events. Uh, hits him with another body kick and just punishes him, backing him up. A little bit wild, but Gon settles things down Uh Starts landing more regularly. I mean, despite being dropped, like, I, it's hard to win a round if you've been dropped, you know, even in MMA. I thought Gon won the second, nearly stopping Tuivasa with those body strikes, taking over the rest of the round and what was left of it. They're both having a good time. Third round, Tuivasa can't find the target again. Not the same way. And he started reacting really badly to those front kicks to the body. I'm going to call them front kicks, but again, kind of inverted rounds. Like, a commentary at one point after he took a really nasty one, like, he made the sound like he's going to hurl. And I think it was John Gooden on the mic who said, you know, he's tasting his lunch right about now. Accurate. Like, those were brutal. Breaks him down with those. Hurts him multiple times. Gets Tuivasa to come forward with another blitz attack. He takes this beautiful angle. He ducks under a left hook that Tuivasa throws at him. Uh, takes an angle. He was angling very well most of the fight. 
angles off and then hits this right kind of it's not a full-blown uppercut it's more kind of a screw punch because it's not strictly speaking hor vertical it's more at an angle but uppercut and on the slow-mo like you could see tui Voss's eyes cross like he gets just frozen in place does not fall over because tai tui Vasa is made of concrete but finishing seek flurry from gone drops him that's all she wrote one of the hammer fists he lands in that final flurry is very clearly illegal it does hit like full on the back of the head and i never like to see that that's very very dangerous but i don't think it mattered in the sense that like what they could have stopped that fight after that punch and uh, tuivasa was out on his feet like he was done it's one of the things about you know, stopping fights in MMA. You don't see enough standing stoppages, in my opinion. Too many referees want to see the other guy drop. They want to see your face plant, and Tui Vasa face planted, and it's it's just not necessary. But turned into a really good fight again. Very very entertaining. Nice to see. Uh, that's the hardest Gon's been hit in his entire UFC run, if not his entire career. You know, Francis and Ganu couldn't hit him. Certainly not like that. Junior, uh, Junior does. Look, man, I love JDS, Junior Dos Santos. My affection for him is pretty well documented. But he's still salty about losing to Gon the way that he did. <laughs> um, he came out on Twitter after this fight and said, "See, he hit the back of the head again. Just such a dirty fighter. Like, I love you, Junior. I really do. You one of the." few like genuinely nice people that this sport produce has produced but you gotta let that one go man you've got to let that one go uh they they shared you know some moments after the fight um very briefly about the crowd one crowd was good all night they were invested you had fans from a few different countries i talked a bit about this last week a lot of european countries are pretty close together there was a large italian contingent there uh, apparently a pretty big Dutch contingent as well that came for different fighters. But I'm just going to say the French for the sake of argument. Like, I think it was the first round of this fight, or maybe early in the second. Like The the crowd just kind of spontaneously sings the French national anthem. I mean, it was... You don't see that very often. It was It was genuinely kind of a great moment. Um, Tuivasa got booed as he was coming out. Of course he did. He's fighting the hometown guy. But he was... By the end of it, I, um, he got a lot of respect from the crowd. They gave him the, his flowers, which he is very much a do. Um, Gon said after the fight, you know, I don't care who I fight next as long as it's for the belt. I mean, that's fair. Look, Cyril Gon is... I watched this fight and just like... I, I am perpetually amazed by what Cyril Gon can do. You know, he doesn't quite have the same, like, one-punch power that Francis Ngannou does, which is remarkable in its own right. But for a man of Gon's size, and he is enormous, I always forget how big he is. I know he's listed at 6'4". Wouldn't be surprised if he's actually a little bit taller. And he officially weighed in, like, 240. If you've ever seen him when he's not, like, in camp getting ready for a fight, I guarantee you he's 260-plus. Like, the process of fighting, uh, of getting ready for a fight for him, I don't think he cuts weight in the, you know, the way that most fighters do. But I would guarantee you that he loses mass and refi gets into a different kind of shape when he's ready for a fight. Like, he's, he's just a big man. And he moves very well, and his technique is impressive. He's got to shore up some of his strict boxing. Like, there was some less than ideal punches he was throwing in this one, but his jab was solid. It's just like when he gets towards the finish, he starts winging a little bit. Rather see that tightened up. But you know, he's still young for a heavyweight. He's still ex he's extremely talented. Uh, gave Francis Ngannou a heck of a fight. I mean, I thought he won, but you know, I'm not... Again, you know, I'm not uh, up in arms over that one. Um, I don't know what... There's giant question marks around the top of heavyweight right now in the UFC. We don't know if Francis Ngannou is going to re-sign with the UFC or not. You know, if he could get a boxing match with Tyson Fury, that would be the single biggest payday he would ever receive. The UFC would never pay him what he would make for that, ever. 
but I do question how many boxing matches he has at a high level that pay that well. Could be more than one. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. We don't know what Fury's doing. I mean, he's going to fight Usyk, but, you know, Tyson Fury is weird. And I say that with respect. He's just a weird guy. Uh, best boxer, best heavyweight of his generation, I think, by a significant margin, but still weird. So there's that. We don't know if John Jones is coming back. He's been making noise about it for the last decade or so, it seems. We've got Stipe Miocic floating around in the e- out there in the ether. There's a lot that is unknown about the future of heavyweight that we just won't know for another few months. But Cyril Gan reminded everyone here, he's at the top. He is very clearly at the top of that division. Whether he's, you know, the very best remains to be seen, but he is one of the best heavyweights in the world in this sport, bar none. I'd still like to see him have to deal with a wrestler. Uh, I mean, if Francis Ngannou can out-wrestle you, and Francis did, you know, Ngannou's a physically strong guy, but he's not the most technical wrestler in the world. I, I would like to think that Gan took the appropriate lessons from that, but I would like to see evidence of it. Um, as for Tuivasa, you know, great heart, great... I mean, no one can question that man's heart. He was in agony in the middle of this fight and would not stop. Like, you, God had to put him down before Tuivasa was going to stop. Um, it was brutal. But he was there... Until he physically couldn't take any more. Like, that's the amount of punishment it took before... He was not going to give up mentally. Um, he's still young. He's got time. But he's got to fix some issues. Like, he's very hittable. Uh, that needs to be fixed. And I think he needs... He needs to find a specific area of the game where he can excel. I don't know what it is. I don't know. And this is a personal thing. Like find, figuring out how you like to fight and how you best win is an individual fight, fighter to fighter thing. But I think he needs to find something other than technical brawler, which is kind of what he is right now. He's he's kind of the Matt Brown of heavyweight. Um, Brown's more technical than Tuivasa, but I think that will give you a general idea. And at heavyweight, that'll take you far, but right about here is probably the ceiling for that, that kind of where he is. He needs to change things up a little bit if he wants to really kind of go for the belt. Um, and to his son, who uh, the story that came out here was, you know, he kind of he was talking with his son who was watching some uh, professional wrestling, I believe WWE, said, you know, I can beat up all those guys, right? And his son kind of, kind of, you know, as, as a smart Alex said. Yeah, but you don't have a belt, and, you know, so-and-so does. I don't know who he was reference, referencing specifically. But, for the record, I have I have immense respect for professional wrestling. I, as a genre, I've said this before, like, wrestling's dumb as hell. But, that's okay. Th- that said, like, the physical toll and what it takes to do to be a professional wrestler physically, like, I have immense respect for it. Like, I can mock... I can mock the genre while respecting the performers. You know, I don't think much of most, like, stand-up comedy, but I can acknowledge the ability of different comedians. Like, I know that's not easy. Uh, or, you know, movies. Like, pick a genre. Like, I may not think much of whatever subgenre of film, but I can acknowledge the amount of effort that goes into making them, etc. So, I say this about professional wrestling. Like, I, I respect professional wrestlers, genuinely. But Tai Tuivasa could run through the combined WWE and AEW rosters at this point. Like he could fight one of one guy of approximately like put him make him heavyweights, but put them in the cage with him and apart from Brock Lesnar, he's the one who's going to come out with his hand raised. Yeah, I'll include Jake Hager in that for the record. Um, but like, any of the rest of them, it's it's not that close. Like. Taito Ivas is really good, especially for a heavyweight. So that was your main event. Good fight. You know, it turned out to be a really good... Did I get fight of the night? It did. You know what? I'll go along with that. That's fair. Uh, okay, so main event, yeah. Fight of the night. Good win for Gon. Should be fighting for some variety of title after this. 
whether that's interim or full or vacant or whatever, like I, I don't know. But it's hard to put him in something other than a title fight at this point. He is the number one contender as far as the rankings go. Co-main event. Robert Whitaker defeats Marvin Vittori via unanimous decision. 230-27s, 129-28. Don't agree with 29-28. Um, first round was not that close. I give Marvin Vittori a ton of credit here because I don't know what Marvin Vittori's head is made out of. But that man just will not fall over. He took bombs from Paulo Costa when they were fighting at light heavyweight. And he never fell. He ate a couple of head kicks here from Robert Whitaker that... I don't know how he stayed upright. I, I just don't. But that man's head is just... I don't know. Like, it's genuinely remarkable. It takes a... Has he ever been stopped by strikes? I need to double check this. Um... Okay. Decision in his debut. Decision a, hand, a handful of fights later. Decision to shoe face. Decision to Adesanya. Decision to Adesanya. Yeah. This guy has fought some seriously dangerous opponents. I mean, he didn't get tapped out by Antonio Carlos Jr. He's a very good grappler. Um, had the draw with Omar Riyakhmedov. He got hurt in that one, but... I don't think he ever got dropped. Um, Cesar Fajaya will... Uh, Andrew Sanchez, Carl Robertson, Jack Hermanson, Kevin Holland, Adesanya, Costa, Whitaker. Like, these are... Those guys have power. Those are dangerous opponents. And even the ones he's lost, like... Give that man credit for his durability. That's... It, it takes some effort to put that guy down. And Robert Whitaker mentioned it after the fact. Like, I pushed... He said that I pushed the fight back... Because I knew I had to be at my best. Like, that guy's hard to put away. I had to keep hitting him so that he was hurt the whole fight. And he, to me, to Whitaker's credit, he did. First round was the most competitive. But I, I said, I still don't agree with the referee, or the judge, rather, who gave it to Vittori. Whitaker just did the better work. Um, Vittori came forward more, but that doesn't mean much if you're not doing a whole lot off of it. Second round on, Whitaker is just... At his best. He's got the rhythm. He's got the timing down. Which means his jab is messing you up. Your punches are falling just short. There's some really nice clips of Vittori falling. Like, glove barely touching or not touching at all. Like, I don't compare people to Floyd Mayweather. Because Floyd is his own animal. But if you've seen high-level boxers, and Floyd was very good at this. I reference him here as a point of comparison. Floyd was exceptional at letting that punch, being so, having such a mastery of distance, that he let that punch, like the glove, would barely, barely touch his skin. And there's no power behind that. Like if all you're getting is the very end, like again, just the very end of the glove to just the skin of your opponent, you're not hitting them. He was so good about that. And there was some of that in what Whitaker was doing here, just letting Vittori fall you know, less than an inch short. Less than half, I mean, less than half an inch short in some cases. Just right there, just, eh, you're out of range. And counter. Whitaker is very good about timing kicks. There's a re He knocked Vittori down a lot with, with leg kicks when Vittori was throwing another kick, which is timing, like, you, and it's it's imp impressive timing. It's not easy to do that to someone. It'll happen by happenstance a lot, where guys are throwing kicks at the same time. But to watch him get a read on it, uh, whew, that is impressive stuff. Um, his jab, as always, Whitaker has one of the best jabs in all of MMA. Uh, he gets kind of forgotten in that discussion a lot, but his jab is really, really good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been singing the praises of Sir Robert of Knuckles for quite some time, and I would be interested in a third fight between him and Adesanya. I really would, especially after how their second one played out. 
I don't know that Adesanya has a whole lot of interest in that. Um, probably doesn't. And we're not quite sure what's going to happen with Adesanya and Pereira uh, come December. Like, that's a that's a big question mark there. <laughs> oh, man. Related to that, this last week, like, did you see some of the pictures? Look, you can look these up if you didn't. Um, Dominic Reyes, uh, light heavyweight contender. Rough stretch, but he's training at the same facility, um, I believe. Yeah, that would be the um, Glover Teixeira's camp in Connecticut, because Alex Pereira trains there. There's some pictures of Reyes and Pereira side by side. Alex Pereira is enormous. <laughs> I mean, he's bigger than Reyes. A little bit taller, but like the musculature is just otherworldly. Again, Dom Reyes is not a small man by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, Pereira is... Man's a beast, so... I don't know what's going to happen with him and Adesanya. I really don't. So that's a big question mark. But Whitaker, man, the distance between Whitaker and the rest of that division, um, it's pretty darn big. It, uh, similar to a prop to kind of, you know, uh, what was going on at Featherweight, where you know, the difference between Volkanovski and Max Holloway and literally everyone else is that's a big gulf. And that's a big gulf at middleweight. Uh, it's a real big gulf between Whitaker, you know, champion and number one contender. He, the difference between Adesanya and Whitaker and everyone else is pretty significant. Doesn't mean they can't be beaten, but that's a big gap. Um, I don't know what should be next for Vittori. You know, this is a tough loss for him. This is um, He beat Costa, so it's not a losing streak. But he has now lost to Adesanya twice. And now he's lost to Whitaker. And there's not a lot of controversy here. I mean, this fight wasn't close. You know, there's one round that was loosely competitive. Rounds two and three were not competitive. That was Whitaker just putting it on Vittori pretty much whenever he wanted to. So he needs to he needs to figure some stuff out. Now, he's very young, so he's absolutely got the time to do that, but... Um, and he's got a good, like, Vittori's in this weird spot. Like, he's got a good overall game. He's physically strong. He's got a gas tank. That guy, that guy's fought five rounds more than once. So, he can fight for five rounds. He's a good wrestler. He's got good top control. He's a good striker, but he's not really... Anyone at the top level, can find at least one area of the game where they are better than him and exploit that. In the case of Whitaker, Whitaker was better everywhere. But Vittori's whole kind of game plan and process is, I'm good enough everywhere to find somewhere where you're, at your we- where you're weaker than I am. And that, will, that kind of well-roundedness will take you a decent ways towards the top, but, you know, the great champions... It's not to say that they're not well-rounded, but you look at what they can do, and they find something that they can just... They have a trump card. Adesanya's striking is a trump card. Like, no one's really been able to beat him at that yet. Khabib's wrestling was a trump card. You couldn't hang with that man. Uh, you know, so they've got something, and Vittori doesn't have something at the moment. He's just a tough grinder. And respect... Like, seriously, respect. The guy could beat me to death with one hand. So I'm not saying it. I'm not saying you know he's not good. He's very good. But he's missing a couple of things that would take him you know, over the top. Uh, let's see. Sticking with middleweight. Next up, Nasruddin Imavov defeated Joaquin Buckley via unanimous decision. Two twenty-nine, twenty-eight, one thirty, twenty-seven. 3027 is a bit odd here, but Imavov had a good... His first two rounds were really good. Um, he was a lot taller than Buckley. He was like, he was like, what, four inches tall or something like that? That would have been six. Like just tall, rangy guy. Uh, kept Buckley at distance, pot-shotted him, pressured him. Faded a little bit in the third. There was enough grappling in the second, I think, that kind of wore him down. 
But even then, you know, in the round he probably lost, that third one, he just, you know, Buckley was swinging and found a few punches, but the the size disparity here was a little bit surprising. Um, I don't know if Buckley can make 170. He's a very thickly muscled guy. But if that's possible, he might want to consider it because the height differential he's going to face at middleweight at times is a real... Is a real that could be a real problem for him. I mean, Buckley's what? He's five eight. Grief. I mean, Imovov. Yeah, to be fair, Imovov's very tall. Imovov's six three, but there are like six four uh, guys at middleweight. Like there are some big guys at middleweight. Buckley might have to consider a, again a potential weight uh, weight cut. It might not be possible. I don't know, but that's at a minimum that's something he should at least explore. A uh, good win for Imovov. He's a, he's flying under the radar a little bit, but Imovov's talented. Uh, also at middleweight, Roman Kopilov defeated Alessio Dikirico via uh, punches, knockout 109 of the third. Not a great fight. The rest of these are going to be pretty quick. Um, not a great fight. Uh, Kopilov just kind of, he hurt Dikirico, I think, near the end of the second. Yeah, a little bit towards the end of the second, got him a little bit buzzed, and then got back on the pressure immediately. In the, uh, it was landing body kicks that Diki Rico was not responding well to. Got him backing up, and then landed a flurry of punches. You know, when when a guy who's 0-2 is your fourth fight, from, fourth from the top on the main card, like it says a lot about the rest of this card. Um, William Gomez defeated Jarno. Jarno Ehrens. Um, this was a majority decision. One judge gave the third round a 10-10 draw, which is... Uh, that is not an accurate reflection of the scoring criteria. Just going to say it like that. Not at all. Like That's a really bad score for that round. I appreciate the morality of finding a way to score this fight at draw because the fight kind of sucked. But <laughs> as a matter of uh, practicality, no reason for this to be a draw. Uh, again, not a great fight. Just Aaron's didn't have a whole lot for the striking of Gomez. Um, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Was good, however... Also at featherweight, Nathaniel Wood defeated Charles Jordan via unanimous decision. 230-27s won 29-28. Wood looked really sharp here. Um, he forced Jordan to do a lot of infighting, like traditional boxing infighting, like forehead-to-forehead forehead kind of stuff. It was really good. He had the more powerful shots. And just seemed to carry, he seemed to carry more power in his hands. He wobbled Jordan more than once. Had some nice calf kicks, again, good trips that led to takedowns. Um, Wood taking that year or so off and moving up to featherweight seems to have done him a world of good. He's not a big guy for featherweight, so he's going to have to navigate those waters. But he looked sharp here. I want to give him credit for that. I mean, uh, I don't rate Jordan as highly as others, but uh, this was a... This was a solid performance out of Wood. You know, Jordan fighting as soon as he did after that fight with Burgos. Man, that was a crazy fight. Um, might behoove Jordan to take a little bit of time off and recover. Like That's two really tough fights back-to-back -to -back in a short amount of time. Uh, but that was your main card. As for the prelims, ooh boy. Abus Magomedov. Um, Abus is short for... I going to butcher that guy's full name if I try to pronounce it, so I'm not going to. Um, he stops Dustin Stoltzfus with a front kick and punches in 19 seconds. If you're going to throw that front kick to the face, you need to do it either, you need to do it when it's not expected, which means either you show a lot of other kicks with a similar kind of hip setup, so they're not expecting it at all, or you throw it when everyone's cold, like when the, right at the beginning of the fight. He threw it at the beginning of the fight, badly hurt Stoltzfus, dropped him with punches not long after. Just He's been... Magomedov had been off for a while because they've been trying to get his UFC debut to happen. He had like three fights fall through. Um, 
He came here to make a statement, and he did. Look, Dustin Stoltzfus is not, I think he's like 1-3 in, in the UFC now. Like, he's not a top-tier fighter, but you run through anyone who can fight and compete at the UFC level. And again, Stoltzfus not win necessarily at the UFC level consistently, but he can fight there. Uh, you do this to that, like, that's a statement. So, pay attention to Abus Magomedov. Apparently, people with some form of Maga Madoff in their name, Aaron Bronstetter tweeted this, have a winning percentage of like 86%. Just having that in your name means you're very likely to win a fight. Um, it's solid, solid win. Great stoppage. Um, at lightweight, Nasrat Hakparas defeated John McDessie via unanimous decision, 230-27, win 29-28. McDessie just a step behind every step of the way. A lot of movement from Hakparas. He kind of bait McDessie into circling. Getting him to follow him, plant, counter. Um, good win for Hackprest. At lightweight, Ferris Ziam defeated Mikhail Figlock via unanimous decision, 230-27, 129-28. Really good fight out of Ziam here. Um, he fought really well. He looked sharp. Um, he looked sharp for the first time in like, his UFC run. He looked good all for pretty much the whole fight. So, credit to him. He's been... Losing more than winning, but he looked good here. Also at lightweight, Benoit Saint-Denis defeated Gabriel Miranda via TKO punches, 16 seconds of the second round. Saint-Denis had Miranda very badly hurt at the end of the se- at the end of the first. Immediately got back after him to start the second. Just did not give him any more time to recover than the 60 seconds he was required to give him. Um, that's something people need to consider a bit more. You don't want to be reckless. But if you hurt someone at the end of a round, uh, you don't want to give them extra time to recover when the next round starts. So, good win for him. Bantamweight Christian Quinones defeated Khalid Taha via TKO punches, 315 of the first. Uh, Quinones looked pretty darn good here. Uh, Taha continues to struggle. Um, yeah, Quinones looked good. It was a pretty solid finish. And kicking everything off, Stephanie Egger defeated Eileen Perez via rear naked choke. 454 of the second round. Just better grappling out of Egger than uh, Eileen Perez. Not a whole lot else to go on there. So that was the event. Um, your fi- your bonuses, again, fight of the night was gone into Ivasa. No issues. Performances went to Abbas Magomedov and Benoit Saint-Denis. Um... Yeah, I might have gone Quinones over Sandini personally, but nah, that, that's that's personal preference. Like that, that's a little bit of splitting hairs, so no issues there. Um, yeah, solid event. Uh, the crowd was again very hot start to finish. This ran the same time pretty much as WWE's pay per view Clash at the Castle. Um, which had, which was in, um, I forget the stadium, but like a soccer stadium in Cardiff. So forgive me for not remembering which one. And they had like 60,000 people there who were rocking and rolling pretty much the whole event. Uh, so they had a good crowd here. They had a really good crowd. Uh, kudos to the French crowd. They stopped the woos. I mean, they still happened on occasion, but they never gained traction. If you listen to the woos at other events... There's some drunken jackass who woos. And then one or two other people on some other part of the arena will woo back. And then it just kind of builds from there. And you got little bits of that here and there for this event, but not a lot. So my sincere gratitude to the French for not participating in that ridiculous tradition that somehow sprung up around mixed martial arts. I genuinely hate it. Uh, That was the event. If you want to read my round-by-round scoring, as well as see clips of the finishes and whatnot, it is in the MMAZona411mania.com, so please do give that a read if you are so inclined. All right, moving on. UFC 279, with its stupidly big card. I'm going to double-check this. Hang on. I'm going to double-check this on something other than Wiki. Because Wiki still has, like, the ridiculous, like, 15 fights listed. And I am begging for that not to be the case. Um, I mean, apparently, you know, 
Apparently AEW is having a pay-per-view event close to around as I record this with a lot with about that same number of bouts. It's bad for a six-hour event start to finish. It's worse for uh, for that. So let me have a quick check here on... Uh, let me compare Wiki with Topology real fast. Um, okay. I think... Okay, I think the part here that is just listed as announced bouts is not official at the moment. I'm going to hope that that's the case, because if it's... If that's the case, we have 13 fights, which is one more than I'd like, but I can live with 13. If it's not, then it's... What? Hang on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12... 13, 14, yeah, 16. So I'm going to, I will talk briefly about the bouts here that are listed as announced and just assume most of these are not going to happen there. Um, I might be wrong about that. I'm just, I'm really not wanting to have them try to fit 16 fights into a broadcast. Uh, that That's just a bad idea. Just a really bad idea. Um, that's listed. Okay, so that one's more or less confirmed. I'm just, yeah, I'm going to go through these and just pray for me that I'm not having to deal with 16 fights. That's just, that's just wrong. That's inhumane. That should be against, like, there should be international laws against this. Anyway, main event. Um, no belt, but... Five rounds, Hamzat Shemaev and Nate Diaz. Uh, let's not, there should be no pretense about this. The UFC is setting up Nate Diaz to get thrashed on his way out the door. That's what they're setting up. They're trying to use a genuine star that they have in Nate Diaz to try and build Hamzat Shemaev. And send a guy that they have had an acrimonious relationship with since basically day one out the door with his face looking like hamburger meat. I had forgotten this, by the way, but um, for, um, there's a resume review that the good people at Morning Combat, uh, Luke Thomas and Brian Campbell, have done for Nate Diaz. It's worth your time if you got the time to listen to it. But... I had forgotten that Nate Diaz, when he won the Ultimate Fighter, it was season five. My favorite season, actually. That was one I still watched. Uh, I, I will go to bat for that season as the best season, believe it or not. Um, a lot of people are nostalgic for one. I don't think one had figured out the overall presentation. You know, they were still doing, like, get fighters being voted off and, um, you know, every week there was some stupid physical challenge. Like, it was... They just hadn't figured it out. Five is like the best mix of talented cast, heated coaches, because that was Jens Pulver and BJ Penn, and the show actually understanding its presentation, its pacing, and everything. So, uh, my opinion. But when he won that season, like he said, <laughs> his post-fight interview, he says like the tough, fi- the tough house sucks. I don't recommend that to anyone. <laughs> and I mean, you can even saying that now will piss off Dana, and now it's like very true. Like tough doesn't matter anymore. Uh, but like saying that then, like Im- I imagine immediately kind of soured Dana on Nate. Um, that's been a bad relationship from the start, pretty much. But uh, look, I'm picking Hamzat Shemaev. I think you would be a fool not to pick Hamzat Shemaev. Now, let me be clear about that. That's not to say that you're a fool for thinking that Diaz can win. He can. He is very durable. He's sneaky off of his back. He's got a good gas tank. He's got, you know, he's rangy. He's got the long-range box. And like the, Nate Diaz's game is very well known at this point. And there are ways he can win. Here's the downside if you're as far as Nate Diaz goes. He has always struggled with physically strong, competent grapplers. 
if you can take him down and you know what you're doing down there and you're physically stronger than he is, he struggles. That's been the case, again, the majority of his career, if not all of it. He struggles with leg kicks. And Hamzat Shemaev, Diaz also not a fast starter. Like It takes him a bit to get going. Once he gets going, he chugs along at a good clip. But his first round is frequently not great. Uh, Shemaev fights like he was shot out of a cannon. Just immediately. Uh, I said, are there ways Nate Diaz can win? Yes. Will I be surprised if he wins? A little bit. Just because of how I think they match up. So, if you're picking, like, there's not a lot of reason to pick Nate Diaz. There are ways he can win. If he drags this thing deep, we've never seen Hamzat have to, five, have to fight five rounds. He was huffing and puffing a little bit in the third round of that Burns fight. If he has to fight rounds four and five, trying to keep that pace, he he's going to struggle. Like that, That's just how that is. So, if this goes long, Diaz can come on later. If Shemaev gets sloppy in the guard of Diaz, he might be in trouble. But Shemaev is a physical force. And he has power. He will mess you up. He will carve you up. And Nate Diaz can be cut to ribbons. I Again, I don't have a reason to pick Diaz here. He has ways to win. I, again, I don't mean that. But if you're asking me who do I think is going to win, I think Hamzat Shemaev is going to win. And there's not a lot of reason to think to the contrary. Like Again, likelihood. Diaz winning is not at all likely. He might do it, and I will... I will be cheering him if he does, because just because I, appreci- I approve of the chaos that would create. I really do. But if I got to pick here a winner, who do I think is going to win... I think Hamza Shemaev is going to win. And frankly, I think he's going to stop him. That might be a corner stoppage or a doctor stoppage, but I I think he gets a stoppage of some variety. All right, co-main event. Welterweight action. Li Jing Liang and El Kukui himself, Tony Ferguson. Uh, I am so torn. At, look, man, I have been here. I have beat the drum for Tony Ferguson for a long time. But... He's on a four-fight losing streak. Two of those brutal finishes. I mean, not to say that he's ever been... It's not that he wasn't competitive in those fights. Like, he was mostly competitive in that Gagey fight. I mean, the longer it went, the worse it got. But he was there. You know, he wasn't all that competitive against Charles Oliveira was somewhat competitive against Daryush, was competitive for the first round of the Chandler fight. Still lost, I think I still, I forget who I gave the first round to, but competitive, then got front kicked in the face, and ooh. Man, that not, that front kick from Chandler, man. Again, if you rate Edwards and his head kick over Usman higher, I respect it. And I don't disagree, but go re... It's painful to rewatch what Chandler did to Tony because, you know, Tony Ferguson has turned in so many great fights for us over the years. But that was brutal. Brutal. Now he's up at welterweight, trying to re-get some semblance of his career back on track. He's 38. He's older than I am. And he's fighting a guy at welterweight who is a really tough out. Li Jing Liang has had some losses at welterweight, but they're not... They're pretty few and far between, actually. Lost a split decision to Nordin Taleb in his second UFC fight. Got choked out by Keita Nakamura in 2015. He was winning that fight until Nakamura found his back late in the third. No, not late in the third, but in the third. Goes on a winning streak, loses to Jake Matthews, goes on, a, goes on another winning streak, loses to Neil Magny, knocks out Santiago Ponzinibbio, loses, he gets run over by Hamzat Shemaev, and then he beats Muslim Salikov in his last fight and stops him in the second round. Li Jing Liang is a tough out. I hate picking against Tony. I do, because I love Tony Ferguson. 
Am I really going to pick again? I am. I'm rooting for Tony Ferguson. I, I want the guy to win. I wish him nothing but the best. That man has given blood and physical health for athletic glory and the entertainment of the fans, and that needs to be acknowledged, and he will forever hold a special place in my pantheon of fighters I just love to watch. But at his age, with his mileage, he can win this. Let me, let me be clear about that. Like this is not a it's not a landslide. But I'm gonna fit, I'm gonna pick Li Jing Liang and hope I'm wrong. Uh, there's a catchweight fight of 180 pounds. This was supposed to I, was this supposed to be something else. I don't know why they changed it. Um, Kevin Holland is fighting Daniel Rodriguez. This is a good fight. Um, Kevin Holland has been a little bit up and down. He's on a two-fight winning streak. Uh, got a nice win over Tim Means his last time out. But I think very highly of Daniel Rodriguez. Um, Rodriguez has only lost once in the UFC. He is 6-1 and one on a three-fight winning streak. Um, he's been out of action for a while. Um, he beat Kevin Lee in August of last year. Not quite sure what he's been out with. But I'm actually going to pick Daniel Rodriguez here. I, I, I'm i not going to be shocked if Kevin Holland wins. He's really long. He fights really well, you know. But I think he's going to get suckered a little bit into Rodriguez's style of fighting. If he stays long, he can keep Rodriguez out of boxing range. That's where Rodriguez really excels. But I kind of like Rodriguez's chances here. Um, but that, that's a good fight. Uh, women's bantamweight, Irene Aldana and Macy Chasson. Trying to gear up Aldana for a title fight. They've been trying for a long time, man. And she's just had these losses that set her back. You know, she had a three-fight winning streak that got ruined with a split decision to Raquel Pennington. I kind of thought she should have won, but... She goes on a two-fight winning streak after that, including a brutal knockout of Ketlin Vieira, only to lose the decision to Holly Holm. Now she stopped Yana Kunitskaya in her last fight. Uh, if she can win here, they might be able to get her into the title picture, depending on what they want to do at women's bantamweight. Um, it's, it kind of is what it is. Uh, Chasson scored a split decision win over Norma Dumont her last time out. Chasson can win if she's able to force this to be in the clinch most of the time. I kind of favor Aldana, though. Um, I've, I've I watched a lot of uh, Aldana's Invicta fights. Like, I've been... I've appreciated her abilities for a long time. If she can keep her footwork going, clinch break effectively, uh, she can win this. And I think she will. But this is a... That's a close fight. Kicking off the main card, we ha we chucked the two craziest guys in the light heavyweight division together and said, let's see what happens. Johnny Walker and Iwan Kutelaba. <laughs> They're nuts. They're crazy people. I can't pick Johnny Walker to win at this point. I, just, I can't do it. Um, he's one and four in his last five. I don't think SBG Ireland was the right place for him to move his for him to go when he was kind of trying to figure stuff out. I don't think that's the best fit for him. Um, Kutalaba's a wild man, but I the like, flip a coin, man. Do not bet on this fight. Do not bet on this fight. I, I can't pick Johnny Walker to win at this point. I just can't do it. But I'm not going to be shocked if he beats Kutalaba. So that's your main card. Not a bad card. Not a bad main card. It's There's no belt, and I'm not sure it's, you know, $60 good. But, you know, it's not a terrible card on paper. It's missing something. Again, it's missing, like, a really, you know, title level, like, really legitimate fight. You kind of wanted something really nice to support Shemayev and Diaz. And I don't object to Ferguson and Lee, but... It's not a strong co-main from a commercial standpoint. Uh, your prelims, Hakeem Dawadu and Julian Erosa. Hmm, this is a featherweight. Um, Dawadu's weird. Like, he'll get some wins that are 
that are solid, but he's not quite what people think he sh he that he's not what people want him to be. Um, Erosa, he's on actually a pretty good stretch. He's five and one in his last six. Logically, this is Dawadu, but this is also the kind of point when he usually stumbles, so who knows. Uh, middleweights, Dennis Tolulin and Jamie Pickett. Ugh. That is not a good fight. <laughs> um, probably going to lean Pickett there, but yeah. Heavyweights, oh, God. Uh, yeah, you know what? I retract my UG a little bit. Jake Collier and Chris Barnett might turn in some fun Fat Man action. Um, Collier coming off that loss to Andre Arlovsky. Whereas Barnett lost to Martin Bidet. Um, it's a technical decision. Yeah, that poor guy couldn't continue if he got elbowed in the back of the head. That sucked. Um, that one might be sloppy fun. Put an asterisk around that. Might be sloppy fun. I lean towards Barnett. Um, that's what's listed right now for the pre for that part of the prelims. For the early prelims, we have Norma Dumas and Danielle Wolf. Probably Dumas. Yeah, Wolf had her professional debut. Okay, she was a she was a boxer. She was an amateur boxer for a while. Um, she had a professional debut on the Contender Series in September of 2020. She's been out for a while. Um, yeah, I'm going to pick Dumont. But, who knows? Um, Chad and Heliger and he uh, Alatong Hele. Hele Alatong? I forget exactly. I think it's Alatong Hele. I mean, one of those guys who's like from part of Mongolia that's sort of part of China, depending on the time of year kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of, there's places in Mongolia that, I've, I mentioned this a little bit ago, that you didn't have family names. Everyone just had their name. So they've been trying to kind of fix that from a structural standpoint. So some people with one name wind up breaking it into, in this case, Alatong and Hele, even though it's just like one name normally. Um, probably Alatong here. Yeah, he's from Inner Mongolia, which is technically China. Yeah, going with Alatong here, um, rather than Heliger. But that's not a bad fight for Bantamweight. Uh, Strawweight, Melissa Martinez and Elise Reed. I believe that's going to be Martinez. Let me double check Reed real fast. Um, no, actually, I'm going to switch that to Reed. I'm going to switch that to Reed. Uh, then we have Darian Weeks and Johan Lainess. This is welterweight. It's probably Weeks, but flip a coin on that one as well. Then the announced bouts that do not currently have a spot on the card. The one that I know is happening is Jailton Almeida and Anton Turkai. Um, going to lean towards Almeida there, but... Um, yeah, Almeida was supposed to fight uh, Shabdur uh, Abdurahimov. But visa issues for Abdurahimov. So, I don't know why they're at catch weight of 220 when that was supposed to be heavyweight. Was Shamil drop into light heavyweight? I find that very odd. I don't know. That's weird. Catch weight of 220, whatever reason. Uh, leaning towards Almeida there. See, then we have Trey Ogden and Daniel Zellhuber. It's lightweight, probably Ogden. Uh, lightweight about Nicholas Mata and Cameron Van Camp. I'm actually going to lean towards Van Camp there. Mata did not impress. I mean, Van Camp didn't exactly stand out too much in his debut either, but Mata has been, like, painfully average. And welterweights, Lewis Kosey and Trevin Giles. That's a fairly easy pick for Giles. Um, again, Giles has been up and down, but, at a t um, yeah, it's, it, it's a pick for Giles. It's not quite as easy as I thought it was. I had to double check what Giles has done recently, but it's still a pick for Giles. So, let's just, again, I mean, really hoping I don't have to deal with 16 fights. That's just, that's too much. We'll be here for eight hours. If there's a 16 fight card, and I don't want to do that. No one wants to do that. Please don't make me do that. Uh, all right. 
Well, that's so. I will be covering that Saturday in the MMA Zone of 411mania.com. Come celebrate the end of Nate Diaz's tenure in the UFC. He's been there for a long time. So stop by, say hello. I always appreciate it if you're able to do so. All right, moving on. So, a lot of rumors swirling that Jake Paul's next boxing opponent will be Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva recently got his boxing license for the state of Arizona. Uh, that just brings that a little bit closer to fruition. I like and Look, I've been one of the guys here who's beaten the drum for Jake Paul in the sense that I think he gets unfairly maligned. Not vouching for him as a human. But there's a lot of people who were not willing to acknowledge the work that that guy puts in and whatnot. Um, but against someone as savvy as Anderson... Um, like that's that's a good fight, for the record. That's a good fight for what Jake Paul is doing. He's trying to escalate. He's going from you know, Tyron Woodley, who was well past his prime. Silva has won a few boxing bouts. In fact, he looked darn good when he beat Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Uh, and I don't just mean that he beat Jr. and they almost screwed him on the scorecards, because they did. But like, look at what he does technically. He's pretty darn good in that. I would favor Anderson. I would favor Anderson. Um, certain websites have Jake Paul as a slight betting favorite. Again, this is designed to induce betting. If you can get, if that fight happens and you can get Anderson Silva at plus money, I don't gamble. I don't give out gambling advice because for a variety of reasons. But just saying, if you can get Silva at plus money and you don't mind losing, which is the eternal caveat in gambling, like don't gamble what you can't afford to lose. But I. If I could get plus money on Silva, I might take that. Again, I don't bet, but that would be tempting. It would be real tempting. So we can keep an eye on that. We will see if that fight develops as we move forward. Um, another Silva in the news here. Ander- uh, Anderson Vanderlei Silva. The axe murderer has announced he is retiring. His son is starting his MMA career. Or one of his sons. Um... I have, I have so many fond memories of Vanderlei. If you only watched Vanderlei for his time in the UFC, I beg of you, go rewatch what that man did in Pride. He was a force of freaking nature. He was a hurricane of violence. He was brutal. He was nonstop. He was a destroyer. He's one of those... Like, some nicknames don't fit. <clears throat> Calling Vanderlei Silva the axe murderer fit if you watched him fight like he was just again he was just a brutal machine and he had some tough losses along the way man but his run in pride is genuinely great he had some good fights in the ufc too by the way just not trying to dunk on those in fact his fight with brian stand is genuinely great but look up vanderlei silva if you were if you've never seen him fight look up some of his pride stuff his trill his fights with rampage are really good. Uh, you can't go wrong. You, just, you can't go wrong with Vanderlei Silva's stuff in Pride. It was all just, again, it was great. So if he, I hope his retirement sticks. He's been out of action for a while, so I expect it will. Thank you, Vanderlei Silva, for the memories. And I mean that sincerely. Thank you. Uh, you've Again, you've given me memories that I will, as a fight fan, will cherish, so. My my eternal gratitude to you, sir. All right. That's all I've got written down, so let me check Twitter, see if anything crazy has happened, and if not, we will do plugs and get out of here. Uh, no. Does not look like anything crazy is broken. Okay, let's do plugs. I don't have a whole lot this week. My usual spate of professional wrestling coverage, AEW's Dark Elevation on Monday... MLW should be coming back on the air at some point this month. I forget exactly when, but be on the lookout for that on Thursday. WWE SmackDown on Friday, and then, of course, the UFC event on Saturday. No damn you Hollywood this week. Um, Not a lot coming out in September. But last week, myself, Mark Radlich, and Pat Mullen got together to review the Sylvester Stallone movie Samaritan, which is on Amazon Prime. Give that a listen if you're so inclined. Punch damn you Hollywood into whatever your podcast platform of choice happens to be. You can find us over there. So, that's it. We will be back here next week for a UFC 279 review. We will cover all of the fallout, and we will preview 
Will we preview? I believe we will preview. Yes, we will preview uh, UFC on ESPN Plus 68, headlined by Corey Sandhagen and Song Yudong. This is, oh, God. Why? Hang on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, okay, 13. Probably not going to be 13. Probably going to be 12 when that's said and done. Okay. Not as bad as all that. It just... That... There's a few of those that need to be adjusted, but... That looked bad for a second there. <laughs> um, Sandhagen and Song, great fight. Giga Chikadze and Sadiq Yusuf is a good fight. Full preview next week. Um... Okay, it gets a little bit less interesting after that. But again, full preview. Hope to see you all then. Until then, I'm Robert Winfrey thanking you again for listening, reminding you to stay safe out there, and please continue to be well, be safe, and behave.